about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. First, let me say this. An angel of the Lord came to Mary first in the, in the uh, field as she was uh, attending the sheep. And he says, uh, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Mother Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. And he says, this, and the angel said, this thing you will birth will be the Son of God, and he will redeem his people. And so the angel came to Mary first, okay? And so, and so after Joseph thought about her for a while, uh, about putting her away secretly, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, he minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take your Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Now, in Mary's version, when the angel said, it said that his name should be called Emmanuel, which translates to be God with us. So he will save his people from his sins. So, Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bury son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. 24, verse 24, then Joseph being being arose from manded him wait i'm trying to read this my reading skills are not great arose from sleep there you go did as the angel of the lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he and he called his name Jesus. So, why do we talk about the birth of Christ? So, let me ask the question to the listeners while we're here, Chris. Why do I want to talk about the birth of Christ? On a, on a day, like yesterday, where Jesus died for all mankind. How does, that, how does the birth of Christ tie in... Now I'm going to ask you too. How does the birth of Christ tie in to the love of God? How does the birth tie into the love of God, Chris? I got to think about that one. Um, Good and provoking thought. He was brought silver and gold. Um, he's, he brought us light in the world. <clears throat> there you go. You're getting there now. He brought us light into the world. Okay, and I'm going to continue with that. Without the birth of Christ, Chris, could we have redemption of sin? No. Absolutely not. So that's one of the reasons why, the reason why Jesus was born to, like the scripture said, to save his people. So in order for us, in order for Jesus to save his people, the first thing that had to happen is, is the birth of Christ had to happen. Now with my listeners, I'm going to give them something they need to think about. And uh, how many comings of Christ were there? I'll give, her, I'll give my listeners a few seconds to think about this. And then I'll give him the answer. It's very, God spoke this to me while I was at work yesterday. And, uh, and it's a play on words for the, uh, another one, but you'll, you'll know about this in just a brief minute. So the answer to that is there's not one, there's not two second comings, but there's three comings of Christ. If you think of it, Chris, the first coming was his birth. The second coming was when he died and arose from the grave. Because any time anybody says that they died and came, the first thing they say is when someone died and comes back to life, they say he came back to life. 
The very first three words is he came back. So he came back a second time dying on the cross. And his third coming, which I do believe will be his third coming, is the one where he is going to come back to take his people back to heaven. So they're actually, in, as far as I know, and what God spoke to me yesterday, there are three comings of Christ, not just two. Because he came back to earth physically to show his presence to his people one last time before he went and departed. Because the Bible says he goes, it says, it says he had, because we're going to get into that, but it says he had not departed to his father yet. So we're going to go with the next scripture. And the first thing first is about the love of Christ and about Jesus is that he was born. And he was born for this one moment right here in John three sixteen. And everyone should know this. And if you don't, I'll give that to you right now. John th- chapter 3, starting at verse... These words are a little smaller for me to understand. Verse 16, for God so loved the world. There's that love again. There's that word love. So God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, gave his son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God, I will keep reading for me, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he gave his son to the world. And how did he give his son? He gave his son by nailing him to a cross, by by. By telling Jesus that you're going to die for the sins of the world. And the world is going to be saved through you. Now, not everyone, and Chris will contest to this, not everyone in the world will be saved. Because the Bible says that uh, many are chosen, but few are called. Or, yeah, something like that. No, many are called, but few are chosen. Meaning that not everyone's going to accept God or accept Jesus being God himself. So first things first is he had to be born so that this can be fulfilled so that God can show love to the world. Because if, and like we said, if Jesus was never born, that you could not be redeemed of sin. Before Jesus was even, even thought about in this world, before God even sent Jesus to this world to be born, everyone in the world would, uh, there was no redemption of sin back then. When Adam and Eve sinned, there was, there was no redemption. God punished them right then and there. He said, you can work to the sweat of your brow, blah, 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 and all that stuff. And there was no, like when you did one wrong thing back in the Old Testament before Jesus died, before redemption came into place, you would instantly take up the ghost and God would judge you for it immediately. There was a scripture where... Uh, a couple of these, uh, a, a man and a woman were supposed to give up their property and give everything they had to God. Well, they held some back. And the prophet goes, look, you didn't hold back from just me. You held back from God. You didn't just lie to me. You lied to God and the Holy Spirit as well. So you didn't just lie to me, but you lied to God. And then in the story continues that they instantly took up the ghost. They instantly died from what they did. Now, now that that happened, God is not in the business of, you know, killing you off now. Don't get me wrong. If you do something wrong, you're going to go to hell for it if you don't repent of it, yes. But you're not going to instantly, God's going to give you a chance to do it again. And again, and again, until you get it right. That's why Jesus died for us on the cross to show that love, to show us love that he loves us so much he wants us to continue doing it until we get it right. Because we're infallible people, Chris. There's no way, guys, that we're going to be absolute drop-dead 100% perfect. It's like Chris said, you can't be. You can't. The only person who can be is God and Christ. Because God is Christ. There's no way you can be Christ. That's what Satan got kicked out of hell for, for being Jesus. He wanted to be Jesus. He wanted to be just like the Most High. If he would have said the first six things, and would have stopped, and would have said, you know what, I am so sorry I said those, God forgive me. God would have forgave him. But since he said, I will be like the Most High, and I will be worshipped, 
upon a high throne. That's when God said, okay, you're not going to be worshipped on a high throne. He threw him in hell. And hell right now is wide open. Hell is wide open. He has not locked him into hell just yet. Hell is wide open. Jesus went down and took the keys to death, destruction, and hell. But here's the thing, though. After Jesus died, well, before Jesus died, all of the uh, Drew, Jews back in the day, when they died and they, they, they went to be with their maker, everyone that died back then went straight to hell first. And then when Jesus came to take the hells, to take the keys of hell, destruction, and death away from Satan, he took all his people with him. So here's the question. Does that mean that at that moment, because when you, when you think about it, the Bible says that when you go to hell, all your sin torments you. So th did their sin torment them for a brief while they're waiting on Jesus to die, come back to life, come back to hell to take away the to take away the keys from Satan to death, sin, or well, death, hell, and destruction. Did their sins torment them? I don't know. Because the Bible says when you go to hell, your sins will torment you. But does that mean that their sins tormented them at that moment because they were technically in hell until Jesus came back? So, with that being said, but Jesus had to be born for him to die. There's no, no man in this world, and Chris will contest this, and I can, me or Chris will never be able to die on that cross. We'd never be able... Number one, I told this to Chris in the first place, I'd be screaming in pain when they stick that in me. The first thing that will, that will not come to my mind is, Lord, forgive them for they're not able to do... The first thing that comes to my mind is, God, what are you doing? That's the first thing that's coming... Because I'm carnal. I'm a very carnal man. I'm, I'm the type of person who still has doubt. Even though, yes, I am a Christian and I love God, I still have doubt. There are things in my lifetime I'm going to doubt. Bill Gaither is saying it this way. He says, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I take the trust. I can't remember the whole song, but I take the finite risk of trusting all the while. That's what it is. But he said, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Because there is going to be unbelief in every Christian's walk with Christ. There is no such thing as perfectly believing in every little thing because when a bad situation happens, the first thing that we go to is, I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how that's going to happen. And let me give you guys an example. And Chris, this is a testimony for what happened with God. But when me and my wife were in Michigan and we were making money, right? God was blessing us. We did not save an ounce of our money at all. We spent it all at the casino. We spent it all at the stores. We spent it all here. We spent it all there. We went out to buy drinks every day. We went this. We were in that. We this. We that. We spent it on going out to eat. By the time we were done, we were struggling. We moved down to Ohio, and God taught us a lesson on how to start saving. We have about five, between five and Ten grand in our bank account right now, which is a miracle, because that's just what it is. It's it's a testimony that things are happening now. Reason why I went into that, I have no quite idea yet why I went into that idea. But we all have doubts. Oh, that's why I said it. We have doubts, and we doubted and doubted and doubted. But see, when we trusted in God, God taught us a lesson and taught us what we need to do so that we won't have to doubt no more. And so, yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I love God. And yes, I have the Holy Spirit in me. And I do speak in tongues at times. But I still have doubts and fears. And I still worry about things because that's just the way my carnal mind is. My carnal mind is going to worry about every little piece of everything. It's like me and Chris had a conversation earlier. I'm not going to detail what the conversation was, but we had a conversation. I never told this to Chris yet. And as we had the conversation, I had the, the uh, strange sensation that something was going to happen. Like I was worried that something was going to happen when we were having that conversation. And so see, my carnal mind worries about things because it, it, our mind is carnal. There is no such thing as having a perfect mindset. You can't. You can't have a perfect mindset because you can't be Jesus. And no matter how much you want to be God, you can't be God. I wouldn't want to be God in the first place. Because only God can do God. 
and only you can do you. No one else can do you just like no one else can do God. The Bible